All right. So I think in the interest of time, uh, we'll start right at 1.45 uh, and we'll get going. Uh, it's my pleasure to have Rich Williams, the CEO of Groupon here. Uh, Rich's first uh, time ever at the UBS Consumer Conference. Yeah. Rich, thanks for, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, thanks, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah. So I want to take one step back before we go deep into the weeds. Big announce, series of announcements yeah. around the last earnings call. You're exiting your goods business. You're making some key investments in the local space and where you want that business to go over the medium yeah. term. Let's just set the table by laying out, for those who don't know, what just happened on the last earnings call, what were the key messages from sure. management? Sure, I'll do that. Uh, and for those in the room, I just refer you to our safe harbor statements on our investor relations sites and um, in our most current releases. Um, but it was great questions. We covered a lot of this in, in, um, in, in our Q4 and full year 2019 release, but you know, there's, there's a couple of big points in there if, if you haven't been familiar with, with the company. Um, and uh, the big one is requires us to take one step back and say, you know, the history of Groupon was really it started as a local services business, and most people are familiar with that part of the business um, where it's you know great deals on things in your neighborhood, whether that's pizza uh, or massages or, or concert tickets. Um, and over the course of the development of that business, we we really by we experimented our way into selling physical goods and physical products, and created a goods business. And that was during the time of uh, you know, where flash sales was a, was a really big part of, of e-commerce growth. And so it, it fit our brand in many ways in those days where it was about, you know, saving a lot of money and, and you know, limited inventory uh, as well. But, uh, and that, that goes back to that, you know, 2011, 2012 timeframe. Um, and that over the years uh, since then has be, had become a pretty big business for us. Um, North, you know, well, at one point, you know, close to $2 billion of billings in that range. Um, but really the e-commerce landscape fundamentally changed, in particular over the last couple of years. And we saw that business, um, you know, really struggling to compete. Um, and, and that's, I think, at the, at the crux of our, of our big, big discussion and, and our bigger announcements over the last couple of weeks has been we made the decision to exit that physical products business. And, and we, we had a really rough Q4 in that business. Um, where consumers just were disengaging with it at a really high rate. And when we talk to consumers about it, it's like, look, you, you, you're, you know, we were a price leader. Um, we had great prices uh, on products that were popular, but you know, when we're shipping in two days um, versus delivering in two days or a day or less, um, consumers were less willing to trade off price for that. And um, you know, it's something that we had considered uh, a lot over the, you know, over the ensuing quarters as we'd seen really the last couple of years that business um, shrinking was really what's right for the business going forward. And, and I guess it boils down to a really simple uh, paradigm of, uh, you know, can we really let a, a business that we can't win in keep us from winning in the business we must win in and that we have the right to win in? And, and that's, those are hard decisions to make given the size of the business being north of a billion dollars in billings, but we didn't feel that we were in a place to compete effectively uh, in the goods or the physical products business, and the level of investment required to effectively compete didn't make sense for us, um, and that it would frankly be a distraction from what is a leading business in local services and local experiences in particular. And we have a you know, north of $3 billion of billings, um, which is far larger than any of our competitors in that space, in, those, in that core market, that's really where our brand DNA is and where the core of our customers are. So we made the, the, the decision to exit goods, focus entirely and exclusively on local experiences, um, which meant really refactoring our brand um, and spending a lot to, to build beyond that value and deals piece of our brand, which is great, but it's limiting. Uh, it meant really getting back to basics and local in many ways, which is hyper-local focus, getting down to the neighborhood level and bringing on amazing quality merchants where we have uh, great customer demand. Um, and then it really meant, you know, focusing on product and really delivering a dedicated and exclusive product that's built around experiences. Uh, not one that's built to, to sell products and experiences and lots of other things, but one that's really focused on an amazing customer experience there. And then last, we also said we're going to be really focused on cost um, because getting rid of a, you know, a, a billion dollar business also opens up the opportunity to just refactor how we're organized and where our costs go, how we're investing, et cetera, and, and we're, we see big opportunities there to just improve and streamline the, the company overall. Okay. When you, when you think about this local space, it's, yeah. it's a space where you get a lot of conversations with a lot of different companies of 
we want to invest more there. Yeah. Uh, we're thinking about moving into that area. What's, what's the current landscape you see uh, for competition in local e-commerce? How do you relatively set yourself apart, and how do you think about that competitive landscape and what kind of investments you need to make to, to, to yeah. take that uh, competition on? Yeah, it's great, great question, and I think this is a spot where, where a lot of people have realized how big that landscape is. And when, when we talk about local experiences, you know, we, we see that as a trillion-dollar-plus TAM. It's very large. It's very fragmented. And it's, it's still very early in its transition from offline to online. Um, and within that, it's not well served. And so even when I talk about our, our billing size in that space, we are the largest by a fair bit as far as we can tell um, in, that, in that space. But there's a lot of people who have realized that it's large and underserved and, and have discussed going into it. And that's everything from uh, folks like Google have, have, you know, have thought about this space quite a bit. Um, there's the, a lot of people talk about the OTAs that have, have taken a look at the space and see it as an opportunity. Um, and then you have some private players uh, as well that, that are earlier stage, um, have valuations much higher than Groupon, even though they're, they're a fraction of our size. So there's a lot of people playing in it, um, for sure, and a lot of people attacking it. The good news for us is, you know, I think we have an opportunity to, to demonstrate we have a right to win there, that we are the leader in that space, specifically from a, a transactions point of view. We sell more units there than anybody else by a long shot. Um, so we have the opportunity to build on that lead, and, and that lead includes things like just our customer relationships. We have a, a big group of customers, north of 40 million customers, um, that actively buy in our platform. Uh, we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of merchants, re merchant relationships in that highly fragmented space, which is hard to build. Uh, we have the trust with those consumers and merchants to, to put, you know, consumers through the door um, and have them transacting and working there. So we, ha you know, we have, I think, the foundational elements to, to succeed and to do well there, um, and, and we just need to prove it. And I think one of the things where we're even seeing we're proving it to ourselves is, you know, we mentioned there's so much in our brand and history around local is that you know, we, as we started transitioning our goods impressions to local, even, even over the, the back part of Q4 and into January, you know, we, we mentioned you know, our units in local started to grow in January. And that's a, that's a huge turn. You know, we were negative 11% in local units in Q4, so we had north of a 1,000 basis point turn in January. Good news for us, we saw that continue into February, because that, that's just part of our, our DNA. Um, you know, local is very much core to what we do. Um, we're seeing as we focus more as a business on that, we're being rewarded from our customers uh, for that focus. Got it. You're, you're one of those companies that when I talk to investors, they know you domestically because yep. they either use or have used the product in the past. But I think there's an underappreciation of how global the company is. Yeah. Maybe multi-part question. You've done a lot over the years to refine the strategy internationally. What moves have you made? How is that position uh, a business position for the long term, and how should we think about it almost relative to what you've done in North America? Great, and I think one of the things we've learned over the over the years in the space, especially in in local, um, you know what what works in London, what works in Milan, what works in Rome, uh, Barcelona, Tokyo, it's actually very similar. Um, you know, there, you may have some some disparity in, in category mix or things like that. But in general, it really is about the fundamentals of our strategy, and that's the right merchants in the right locations with great pricing and great convenience uh, supported by a better product. And, and so when we think about the work we've done in international, uh, which has been a lot over the years, as you mentioned, I mean, part of that was focusing on a smaller, a smaller group of markets that still represents about, you know, an addressable market size about twice the U.S., so, but narrowing that down so we can focus on the, the bigger markets and bigger cities um, where we see a lot, of, a lot of the characteristics that we like to see. Um, we've done a lot to simplify the product and, and, a, uh, and bring the product to parity. Um, so while it's earlier stage, as an example, we're, we're a global technology stack. It's, we're a single platform company. So what happens in the product in North America happens in international and vice versa. So that's been a big step for us to get to that place of parity in the product. Um, and another, and, you know, I think one of the things we're doing now as a truly global uh, operation is we're launching things in international first. And that's something when, when we launched our booking tool as an example and our booking capabilities, we launched those in our international markets. Um, we were, and we specifically focused on dining and international where in the course of the year, we, you know, we went from basically nothing to north of 65% of our, of our dining business being on our booking software um, and booked through our tools, which is really significant. And so that we're actually using now international to teach us how to do the same thing 
in the US. So a lot of this has been about parity and bringing things to, you know, to the same level. As we think about the future though, and I think you, you point this out, we're not valued for this. People don't really uh, ascribe a lot of value to our international business. And in fact, they ask us all the time, like, why are you in international and not just uh, North America? And we say every time, look, the, the formula is the same. The, the strategy is the same. The, a city is a city in this case, and, and our strategy will hit that piece of it. Um, it's, in our view, given the size of the addressable market, the population is so large, um, and you know, the markets that we're in, have so, they're so similar in their characteristics to the U.S., it's a significant call option for growth. And, and I don't think we're valued for that today. I think people underestimate the, the potential in, the, in those markets. Um, but for us, it's about executing the strategy well in those markets, and you know, we see nothing but potential and upside there. Got it. Um, coming back to the investment side, yeah. so as you look out to 20 and beyond, um, you know, on the call you framed some of the investments that are going to put a pressure on margins in 20 versus 19. Maybe just frame up again what some of those investments are, um, how many of them are investments that are a new normal for the long term, mm -hmm. and how many of them are sort of a non-recurring nature sure. that's, that's sort of about that repositioning effort. Yeah, it's, it's great. And I think that it's important to, to if, I, if I, again, step back from it a little bit, you know, we, we said, and I said it just a couple minutes ago, we're focused acutely on cost. Um, so a lot, when we talk about a lot of the investments we're making, it's important to remember we're still taking costs out of the business, um, which means we're really, it's really about prioritization and reallocating our folks and making sure that we're working on the things that will drive performance and results. But those areas of investment um, and that we're, where we're allocating uh, folks really acutely, one is, is on, again, resetting how we go to market in local to, to gather uh, and to bring small businesses on our platform. Um, it's much more targeted. It's much more about neighborhoods, not cities or markets. Um, and it's, it's about matching supply and demand. A piece of that has been us evaluating how we enter the market from a margin perspective um, and, and even how we think about discounting on our platform. And this is a place where we see an opportunity based on our results uh, to date um, to be much more flexible on every one of those. Um, one, that our platform should always be competitive in terms of margin. So it's a competitive landscape. Um, we should be competitive on margin. Um, and we should give flexibility to merchants who want to come on our platform. You shouldn't have to discount by 50% to be successful on Groupon. Um, we now learned over the last couple of years that's possible. Um, and we, we shared this in, in our Q4, and I don't think a lot of people recognize that over the last couple of years, that the no discount, low discount part of our business uh, has grown by over 60% CAGR. Right? It's, been a, it's been a really great growth story for us. And in 2019, that was well north of a $100 million business. So it's not a small part. Um, and those are no discount, low discount pieces. Learning from that, when we go to market now, is saying, hey, you're, it's your business. You tell us how you want to sell. Um, and we're going to be competitive with everywhere else. Um, so that, that will create a little bit of um, some changes in, in our take rate, but it doesn't really change the unit economics. And I think that's the important thing to remember. So the example is, if, uh, if normally a $100 item is sold for 50 bucks on Groupon, uh, and our average take rate is 30%, we take about 15 bucks a unit. When we sell that $100 item, if, if the industry standard margin's 15, we still make 15 bucks. So on a unit basis, we're making the same amount of gross profit per unit, basically, in those low and low discount environments. Um, but that means a lot to a merchant to have that flexibility that they didn't feel that they had before. So investing in the systems, the tooling, the capabilities to ingest that kind of inventory and go to market that way uh, is a big piece of it. And the other, the other areas of, that I mentioned, you know, on product, we have a, a ton of work happening in the product to really refactor how it works for consumers. Uh, the first step of that is even live now. So the app that you saw seven days ago is different than the app you see today. Um, look and feel is starting to change. Merchandising is starting to change. More of that is coming. Uh, and we're accelerating that roadmap like crazy um, to enable merchants to, to really use that new format and, and the new tools in the app and merchandising. You know, we're, and we, we have a whole series of these milestones that we've laid out. You know, you're seeing more self-service options for them. Self-service deal creation is something you'll see, and offer creation is something you'll see even this quarter, uh, moving to offer management and other self-service as we move throughout the year. So there's really a, a ton of that product, core product and experience work that's happening, um, and that's happening while we prepare for really that brand relaunch in the, in the back half of the year. Got it. So let's, let's stick with the supply side. Yeah. 
of your marketplace for a minute. So um, you talked a little bit on the call about achieving uh, deeper density or, or, or going more dense on the inventory side yeah. in certain markets. Talk a little bit about what that means in terms of a strategy and how you implement that. Yeah, so, uh, you know, this is about, uh, at its basics, and, and, you know, we, we haven't talked about the specific markets given how competitive it is out there, but at its most basic level, this is about demand-weighted supply, right? So where we know we have demand, whether that's through all of our app data, we have you know, more than 200 million downloads, we have a lot of data out there. Uh, we have billions of search queries every year that's coming through, our, coming through our systems. We know where we have demand and we know where it's underserved. So a lot of it, this is about really honing in on where is that demand in what categories and in what specific areas of the country and really targeting those and, and on a micro market level uh, all of our sales efforts with the new pitch, with a, with a new product that effectively gives merchants flexibility, that targets quality um, over just raw quantity. Um, so it really is bringing that demand-weighted intelligence to what we're doing and being much more directed with our sales force with stronger tools to enable more merchant acquisition. Uh, and we're seeing really nice effort. You know, we're, we're only a couple of weeks into our, our market launches there, um, but we're already seeing literally an order of magnitude change in our target markets in terms of, uh, of uh, merchants acquired onto the platform. And that's just in the first weeks out in the market. Um, so merchant response has been really encouraging. Too early to tell, um, you know, too early to see things like purchase frequency, et cetera. But, you know, the, the inputs to that long term, we know purchase frequency increases with density. So getting that density, getting high quality merchants in those locations is critical. And we're already seeing really strong response to that. Okay. You also, similar on the supply side, you talked about a medium term goal, 22, of getting to yeah. about 70 percent of bookable Inventory, where does that sit today, if you're able to say, or, yeah. or help us better understand the glide path towards that 70%? Yeah, we, so this isn't something we've discussed uh, in the past, but um, just to give you a you know, rough, um, rough area, we're, we're at about 25% bookable uh, today when, when I include our partnerships, and I think okay. that, that's a really important thing to include um, because our, our partnerships – uh, we're bringing on great brands, whether that's, um, you know, an AMC or, or Universal Parks and Resorts, et cetera. We're bringing on great brands that are bookable or they're ticketed. Um, and so, and, 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 you know, our goal isn't to just roll out booking software. It's to make our inventory bookable. In order to do that, our software will play a part of it um, because we, we've built booking software that, that serves uh, many merchants that aren't served by the kind of enterprise class booking tools. A lot of pen and paper merchants are out there, and we built a really simple tool that helps them. Um, but for the folks that are using enterprise class tools, we're partnering with folks, whether it's Redeem that we just announced uh, earlier this week or, or late last week, MindBody, et cetera. We want to bring those tools to our merchants so they can use whatever software they want. And if, and if they don't have the software, we'll give them ours. Um, so the partnership plays a big piece of it. Uh, it also enables full catalog. And when, you know, what the other thing that we're doing as we go to, go to merchants today um, that we haven't done in the past um, is ask them to put all their services on our platform instead of just the one thing that they want to sell or the, or the one deal. If it's, you know, the old Groupon, it would have been $59 massages. And, and even though that salon has facials and microdermabrasion and all kinds of other things, we're saying to that salon now, great, let's put the $59 massage on, but let's put facials and microdermabrasion and everything else that you have on, on the platform. And you can put it on for full price. You can put it on for a discount. It's up to you. Um, partnerships enable that in a, really, in a really seamless way. So you're going to see us continue to push on that. Um, we've got a big catalog of those that we're, that we're, uh, that we're working to integrate. Um, that's going to be enabled by really off-the-shelf APIs to make it really easy uh, to integrate with us instead of us doing all the integration work, which would be a nice change. Um, and, and look, we think we're on the right track there. We, you know, we, I mentioned AMC. That's something that we're, we just integrated AMC uh, later last year and in the, the back half of last year. We're already on a seven-figure trajectory there. Um, so that's real volume on a platform from a partner because they have great inventory, great quality, uh, and an awesome experience. So when you buy a movie ticket on Groupon, you, just, you buy it and you scan your Groupon app. The, the code's right there. Um, so that's the future of the product, and, and partnership will play a huge part of that. So uh, without talking about future partnerships, are there certain verticals that you're not as exposed to today where you see the opportunity that if you could gain exposure to certain verticals, it might improve conversion or ROI sure. on the demand side as you're bringing users and traffic onto the platform? 
Yeah, I, I think it's a bit of a, there's a bit of a tale of two cities here, and, and, and that's and really the U.S. versus our international markets. Um, in the U.S., you have some really strong category players in, say, like dining, as an example. Um, and, you know, we're, so we're not as far along in dining in, in the U.S. space, but in international, we're really far along on the dining side. It's much more fragmented there, and we have a nice, uh, a nice space uh, to work in there. So, and the, the other example that we're really strong in things like ticketed events in the U.S. Uh, we have a great relationship with Live Nation. We work really well with Ticketmaster. Um, we have a lot of integrations on that side. That's much earlier in its development and international for us. So we have spots of strength um, that's really based on market dynamics uh, across the company. So in a place like uh, the U.S., we're very much focused on our health and beauty, our beauty and wellness business, um, our things to do in our events business. Where we have great head starts. They're, they're more fragmented um, in that space. International, you know, we have a really strong dining business, and we're building up those other businesses. So it's, we're, we're regionally sensitive there, but the, the three big buckets that I mentioned are really the core of our focus, regardless of where they happen to be today. Got it. One question that came in through the app, and just a reminder, if anybody in the audience does have questions, you can sure. use the conference app to send them up to me. I can try to work them in. When you do strike a big partnership, does that tend to have a greater impact on conversion of traffic or bring new users into Groupon as an ecosystem because people find out that you can book you know, yeah. AMC tickets through Groupon and therefore yeah, yeah. is it a stimulant on the demand side in terms of bringing in traffic and users or is it more of a stimulant to conversion when you do these partnerships? It's a bit of both and, and you know, using, using something like AMC is a great example. You know, we, we went to AMC because we saw huge demand on our platform for movies. You know, people are coming to Groupon, and they're not typing movie deals. They're just looking for movie tickets. Um, so when you want to go to movie tickets, we said, great, we should partner with AMC. Um, and so that was really about conversion and harvesting demand. Um, but that also, I think the, the benefit of that, I do believe it provides a halo. Right? When someone searches for movies and they see you, you have the theater that's in their neighborhood, and it's a great theater, and they have a great experience, I think that generally is a halo that's positive for the business. You see the same thing in, in a, I mentioned Universal uh, Parks and Resorts. That's just a great brand. You, when you see that brand on Groupon, it may surprise some people. And if I were to go back a couple of years, I think people would be very surprised that Universal works with us in the way that they do, um, you know, given we were such a high discount uh, oriented site at the time. And we, we discount their, their tickets very little, and yet we sell a lot. And so when I think people go and they look for something in Orlando and they see what we have or they go to Vegas and see what we have and they see those big brands, it, it, I think it helps with conversion, it helps with repeat traffic and visitation, um, and it's just good for the brand overall. Okay. Um, flipping now to the demand side, you talked about uh, the new marketing strategy taking a more full funnel approach. Can you talk a little bit about how you see your marketing funnel evolving? What are the investments you want to make into that funnel? And you know, most of what you talked about with the company is sort of a three-year arc towards 22. Yeah. What does your marketing funnel look like a couple of years down the road? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I think we're, we're um, in, the, in the industry, we're, we're kind of known as a, as a really adept transactional marketer, kind of that lower funnel marketing. And, and when we sat out on this course, we, we said, look, we, we recognize our brand has a ton of equity. This is a brand with awareness. It's you know, almost 90% <laughs> total awareness on the brand. So it's a well-known brand. Um, but it's a well-known brand for discounts and deals, um, and the opportunity is to bring that awareness level to, to really a, a new position. Um, so as we looked at that, we said, yeah, look, our, our, our marketing needs to, just, to not just be good at the bottom of the funnel. It needs to be good everywhere, uh, and there's real work for us to do at the top, and there's real work for us to do in the middle. And, and our view on that, and I think it's important to say, is usually when investors hear uh, something like jargony, like full funnel marketing, they're thinking, okay, they're going to spend a bunch of money on, on ads, like really expensive, fancy ads. Um, we actually think about it in, in a different way. We're thinking much more, let's use our low funnel expertise and efficiencies that we keep gaining there to help us explore some of those areas. And yes, if we're going to run video ads, those video ads should be aligned with our new brand position. Um, so we need to do that at the very top. Um, but a lot of our focus, and I think where we're going to see a lot of leverage over time, is really in the middle of the funnel. And when I think the middle of the funnel, it's much more in the social, the social sphere, um, where instead of being a very adept display advertiser on Facebook, it's really about how are you inserting yourself and making it easy to drive conversation and dialogue from your brand. And, and so that'll be a big piece for us 
um, which is less about raw spend and much more about how we enable consumers to share and explore and, and help others discover um, great things. So we see that, that combination of great efficiency at the bottom, enabling us to invest more um, and, and re really reallocate and redistribute spend throughout the funnel to achieve a much more balanced marketing approach instead of just being you know, really drilling at the bottom uh, and being a, just an adept search advertiser. We need to be much more expansive than that. Okay. Um, you've called out traffic headwinds. Google, uh, you know, pretty much every year creates some degrees of Google uh, traffic yeah. headwinds yep. for folks in the industry. Um, talk a little bit about the traffic headwinds you've seen that have acted as headwinds for the business, how you can overcome them, what investments you're making, and sort of altering your exposure maybe even to those headwinds. Sure. Uh, it's, it's, um, you know, this is a spot we've been very transparent about the traffic headwinds we've experienced. And even last year, it was north of $100 million of, of traffic headwinds, and uh, with, with email being a big part of that. Um, you can see that in, in the data we've shared, just how much email has reduced as a percentage of our traffic over the last five years. Um, SEO is also one. People talk about that one a lot. There's been a ton of algorithm changes over the course of last year. Some of them help, some of them hurt. Um, but I, I think, again, you know, abstracting from that a little bit, I, I think the core of how we improve here and, and where it's, it's not so much about um, the changes in, in the consumer and the marketplace is the core is, is having a great value proposition that drives direct traffic. Um, and that's the one thing that when you look at our traffic mix today, we're basically a majority direct traffic business at scale, which a lot of folks are much more dependent on Google than we are um, and other big traffic sources. So we're, we're kind of in an interesting position and, and how we've invested in mobile over the years has helped us build that direct traffic. Um, but we see the work that we're doing on hyperlocal supply and being incredibly focused on supply density. Uh, revamping the product to be more rewarding as a local experiences platform, um, having that more top of mind awareness through sharper marketing and full funnel integrated programs. Um, you know, those are the things that are going to drive direct traffic, and that's that's really critical. The other pieces from that, when you have that really strong value prop that's getting people to come back, new channel development in the mid funnel is an example with things like social. That just becomes easy. It becomes much easier when people want to share what you have. Um, they want to tell their friends, and they want to get back to that viral uh, capability that really created Groupon. Um, so I, I think so much of what we're doing now to, cre to offset some of those challenges, it's all about value prop. It's all about being really clear to co consumers how, and merchants, for that matter, how our platform works, why it's good for them, why we create unique value that can't be created elsewhere, um, and how we take care of them in that process. And I think that, you know, that's really at the crux of it. Um, and you know, the, the other pieces will track along with that. You can see our track record there, which in direct is really, I think, really impressive over the last couple of years. But we, we see a ton of opportunity to do even more. So one that came in from the audience that's maybe dovetails on top of that that could be interesting is you, you've had a lot of users that either have the app on their phone yeah. and are relatively inactive or non-active. Is there a plan in place to try to re-engage with people that you think already have the app on their phone or have been a customer in the past that can create direct traffic with someone that's already sort of aware with the brand, of the brand? Absolutely. And, and so there's, there's a lot of work going on right now and, uh, on that front. And um, there's a really specific focus right now for us on cross shoppers. And, th and when I say cross shoppers, it's folks that have been uh, multi-category buyers um, in both in goods and in local. So a lot of our focus in that, that world right now is on ensuring we have a great experience for those cross shoppers and we can uh, successfully and, and really rewarding, in a rewarding way, transition them to being local buyers. So that's a lot of it and that's really a great test bed for us as we move those folks uh, into being more local specific. Because we, you know, we have to get them to engage in different ways. We have to build that top of mind awareness. We have to build a different value prop for them uh, and deliver it. And then from that, we can extend that everywhere else. And you know, you, you've seen a lot of, of things from, on that front from us, whether that's exclusive deals, ex early access, et cetera. So there's a, there's a whole cadre of things that we're doing there um, that are supported by our, you know, our, our density initiatives, our brand initiatives, and product initiatives as well. Okay. Um, you mentioned earlier investing in the tech stack, um, having yeah. a more global tech stack. You're making a transition uh, to the cloud, a number of investments you're going to make there over the next three to four years. Talk about why you made that decision to go down that road 
uh, to transition into yeah. the cloud, how to think about the investment you're making to yeah. transition in that manner. What, what, what sort of walk, walk us through the thought process around that? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing. Most most people, when when we talked about that, were actually surprised we weren't in the cloud. They're, they're, you know, we're we're a scale player, but we're we're not mega scale, right? We're we're in this zone where most people are surprised that we're we're still running O and O data centers. Um, part of that has been historically that we had a really complex um, technical environment. We had we didn't have a stack, we had eight. We had eight different platforms running around the world, and and so, you know, part of our, our process here was getting to one. And when you have one, that migration becomes a lot easier. So the reason why, ultimately, besides having, you know, you know, there's only a company our scale with our size, we may run an, a data center really well, but you're, you can only have so many data centers within our scale. And so a, a big reason for moving to the cloud is, is, you know, you have reduced latency. We can be closer to customers and deliver a faster experience for them. Uh, you also have really rich tool sets that you can leverage, whether that's machine learning tool sets, AI tool sets that are off the shelf so that we're not always having to create those ourselves from, from zero. We can leverage an existing tool and tune it. So we see that given all the work that we're doing on hyper-local density, on marketing and getting closer to customers. There's just so much opportunity to accelerate that process moving to the cloud. So there's a lot of that. There's just agility there and proximity. You also have things like uh, disaster recovery and business continuity that's just hardened in that space. Um, that's difficult to replicate when you're when you're an O and O provider. So there's a lot of reasons for it. Um, the you know from an expense perspective, we actually see it as a as a cost saving opportunity yeah. um, because we're, we're a subscale player running data centers. Um, so we see that as ultimately a cost saving opportunity for us. But in the short term, there is a there is a change between capex or or in some cases you know uh, financial leases and operating expenses in the cloud. So there's some of this is optical shifting around versus yep. real dollars moving uh, from one spot to the next. But more than anything, it's, it's, a, it's about speed, it's about security, it's about agility and capability. Um, and we do see it with some cost benefits over the long term. So uh, maybe just one quick follow up there. Yep. While I think the amount of money it will cost for the transition caught more of the headlines on this yeah. topic. Yeah, yeah. When can investors expect there to be a yield or an output from those investments, either in the shape of more more business flexibility, taking advantage of some of those tools, or more yield in the form of maybe OPEX synergies or free cash flow conversion. Is that a couple of years out? Yeah, I would I would think about some benefits being, you know, some of what you mentioned there being a couple of years out. We said it was a three to four year process. If that's one we can pull in because we're seeing benefits, we'll pull it in. Um, but you know, we obviously have a big a lot of software, you know, with the exit of the goods business. That's a bit of a shifting sands environment there. Um, that we need to clear, but if we can move faster, we will. My, my actual my belief there is that um, we'll see more leverage initially coming out of the agility and speed. Faster speed to market on new product development, we'll, we'll likely see more benefit from that faster than we will some of the cost pieces as they transition off. That, that's, you know, our, at least our, what we're building toward and what our hope is. And if we're seeing more benefits there, we're going to pull in timelines as fast as we can. Great, okay. Um, so let's let's tie it up in the last few minutes. You laid out some goals over the next couple of years yeah. of where you want the company to go over 22. We touched upon them a little bit earlier in the conversation, but why don't you walk us through the framework of how we should expect the business to evolve, whether it be from a, a, a growth standpoint or a margin evolution standpoint, um, and how, how, to, how should investors yeah. be thinking about point A, which is Q4 of 19, which is yeah. behind you, to 22, which is a couple years off in the distance. Yeah, it's great. And so in 22, just to frame that for folks, if you haven't seen it, you know, our, our, our view there is, is, you know, we're working toward a high single digits units and billing growth, you know, mid single digits revenue growth and, and adjusted EBITDA margins in the teens. And so that, how the, the from here to there, um, there's a couple of really key pieces of it. The, the first, as I mentioned, is and this is wave one, is start to, starting to transition from the goods business to the local business. And we're already seeing positive unit trajectory there in now January and February, which is great. Um, but that's really tip of the spear. Um, and then when we've said that starts to carry us through and in the second half, we should have you know, more consistent uh, positive growth in units, and, which I think is really key just to, just to reignite demand on the platform. And that's really, the thing we're most focused on now in terms of the core of the local business is igniting demand, which is that's the, 
Yeah, coming off of a, you know, a year in 2018 and 2019 where you know, we had local unit compression, um, really accurately and acutely using those impressions to drive that demand and rekindle that demand is, is absolutely critical. Uh, along that process as well, you'll, you're seeing, you know, we'll, we expect some, you know, the, and we've talked about this, there, the margin profile or, or take rate profile will change, but um, you'd also expect an ASP change or an average selling price change to start to go along with that because we're selling more full price stuff. Um, even if that full price stuff comes at a, at a lower take rate, um, you're seeing some more of that. And, and that combination of unit trajectory and demand, unit growth with, uh, you know, with higher ASPs, and, and uh, you should start to see billings track that. Historically, that's, those, those have been coupled really well. Um, and then on the bottom end, as we think about um, you know, getting into that margin profile that we discussed in the teens, we're very focused on cost takeout. Um, so we've, we've talked about just in the goods business, there's about $75 million of SG&A that, that we'll remove. Um, there's another $50 million plus that we're attacking on top of that, um, some of that being indirect expenses associated with it, some of it being just opportunities to improve how we work. Um, so there's a cost improvement as we go through that process as well. Um, and that's, you know, that's the formula on the model to get there. And a lot of that cost, as we mentioned, you know, with the Q3, end of Q3 exit, um, estimate for goods in the U.S., end of the year estimate of exit, um, you know, for, for international, uh, given we have works councils and things like that, um, that, that could slow us down a little bit uh, on the international side. You should start to see the cost profile really start to, you know, to hit in 2021 and beyond. But, you know, we're going to do everything we can to, to gain cost and efficiency this year as well. Um, but it's really that construct of demand, and starting to get you know, density driving uh, and, and selection really driving you know, more, more billings and more capacity um, that's supported by you know, a, a more, you know, more efficient, more sustainable cost structure. Okay, and I wanna end on one thing that I think unfortunately the, the, the stock or the, the dialogue with investors gets very yeah. bogged down in, which is customer net additions, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's, there's gonna be some interesting puts and takes in the next year. You're, exiting the goods business and there clearly were probably users that were more goods users than yeah. local users but you also it seems like in q4 saw less attach rate or more of a drag on the business as as yeah. goods went off so you made the decision to exit so just help educate investors so there isn't a lot of confusion in the next 12 to 18 months of how you think about yeah. what type of customer growth you want to have and what type of customer you're going after yeah. in terms of marketing investments it's great, and I'm glad you brought that up because it, it's it is a you know this is a, a a part that will have noise, and and this is the first time we've broken out uh, our customer base by here's people that are are local buyers, here's some cross shoppers, and here's the dedicated goods buyer. And we also talked about in Q4 uh, goods was disproportionate in our loss of customers. Um, it's not surprising given the the magnitude of the shrinkage there. Um, so. We said there's, there's roughly 8 million goods-only buyers. I would expect, well, you should expect us, we're going to do everything we can to keep those people on our platform. We've invested in them. They get their hair cut. They go get massages. Right. They have kids that they take to bounce houses to. We're going to do our best to keep them on the platform. But we should expect if we remove what they're buying today, we're going to have some amount of loss there. Um, I just don't know, what, I don't know how to estimate that yet, given we're still early in the transition. But we should estimate that loss. The important thing, however, which is also something we shared for the first time, is our local purchasers specifically. When I talk about purchaser, it's someone who breaks out their credit card and buys in the, in the period. So as we think about it, the more important measures for us, uh, and they're really the important measures of demand and the quality of customers that we have, it's purchasers and it's units per purchaser. And we shared that data for the first time uh, coming out of Q4, and you can see the trajectory in both of those is what we want. They're both up and to the right. So we're actually getting more purchase frequency out of our local buyers and we're having stronger performance period over period in local purchasers. That's the formula for long-term purchase frequency and that will drive health of customer base long-term. And in the, over the course of the next year, year and a half, maybe even into 2021, given it's, it's a TTM measure, you know, 2021 will be a reflection of, what, of actions that were taken in 2020. So, it's, a, it's an unfortunate lagging measure of that active customer right. piece. What I would recommend you know, investors look at is what we look at every day, purchasers, units per purchaser. Those are like true health of marketplace measures, and, and we'll be sharing those as we go. Great. 
Well, Rich, there was a lot of puts and takes in there. It was yeah. a very complicated last earnings call. So <laughs> thank you for yeah. taking the time. Thanks for coming thank here to meet with investors and have the conversation. We look forward to seeing how the, the transition evolves over the next couple of quarters, a couple of years. Thanks. We appreciate it. Great. Thanks, uh, Rich. Uh, Joy, please join me in thanking Rich for being part of the conference. Thank you, guys.